So let me just give a brief introduction to our theme, to our topic today. Why Hezbollah is Europe's problem too will be his topic today. This phrase is not at all banal because it is, is still denied in Europe and here in Germany especially. As you might know, there has been an ongoing conflict between Europe on one side and the US and Israel on the other side about the question whether Hezbollah should be listed as a terrorist organization in Europe. John Brennan, US President Barack Obama's assistant for counterterrorism, just recently addressed the European Union that failure to designate Hezbollah as a terrorist organization makes it harder to combat its activities around the globe. Arguments in Europe we hear against the listing are it can't be done because the organization is split into a terrorist military wing and a political wing which acts as a rational agent in Lebanese politics. A listing would raise the aggressiveness of Hezbollah only and therefore be counterproductive. It even might destabilize the political balance of power in Lebanon and lead to more violence. The relations to the Iranian regime are downplayed and so we have a situation where the Iranian regime is still lauded and gets support for its so-called anti-drug policy while its proxy is a major player in international organized crime. So these are some of the official arg arguments, but we also have to take into account the mood behind them. Hezbollah is still seen as a problem which mainly concerns Israelis and Americans. This is the background we surely will discuss after Mr. Levitt has presented us his insights on the global terrorist activities of Hezbollah. Please, Matthew Levitt, go ahead. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And let me apologize in advance for the fact that I can't do this in German. Um, I'm especially grateful to, uh, to, to Michael, to Andreas, uh, to Reif uh, for, uh, for making this possible. And uh, while I will do my part and give the, uh, the opening uh, comments here, what I'm really interested in is the conversation. Uh, whether you agree with what I have to say or not, it's the conversation that matters. Having this conversation is what it's all about. My problem is that we're not having this conversation. Uh, and I think that there's new reasons to have a conversation about Hezbollah and what to do about Hezbollah, whether it's a designation or other things. Let me start to lay out why. A couple of weeks ago, we had the 29th anniversary of the Beirut barracks bombings, Hezbollah's bombings of the US Marine and French Army barracks uh, in Beirut. It turns out, we now know through uh, court testimony in federal cases in the United States, that at the time, US military intelligence had intercepted a communication between Iran's Ministry of Intelligence and Security in Tehran and Iran's embassy in Damascus, in which Iran's Ministry of Intelligence told its diplomats in Syria that it wanted an attack against the peacekeepers in Lebanon and told them to task uh, the groups that were then being molded into Hezbollah, the various Shia militia groups, um, including Islamic Amal, to carry out such an attack. There already were all kinds of warnings that something was in the works, but they didn't know what. And unfortunately, the message that was intercepted didn't get where it needed to be in time to thwart the attack. One of the reasons I think that happened is because at the time, just a few years after the Islamic Revolution, very few people appreciated the dangers presented by the revolutionary leadership in Iran and by its proxies, Islamic Amal, Hezbollah, etc. Nobody can say that today. Nobody can stand and look you in the face with a straight look on their face and tell you we don't have evidence or reason to understand the nature of the threat presented by Iran or by proxy Hezbollah. I'm going to focus on Hezbollah here. If you want the questions and answers, we're happy to talk about Iran. We can get to that too. Obviously, you cannot discuss one without the other. 
Shortly after the Beirut bombings, we had the first instance where Hezbollah started doing acts of violence outside of Lebanon. By any definition, the bombings in Beirut targeting the uh, Marines, certainly targeting the U.S. Embassy, first in 1983, then the Embassy Annex in 1984, were acts of terrorism. But some might say those were acts of domestic groups trying to kick out foreign occupiers. I don't personally buy that. But it didn't take very long for Hezbollah to start doing other things targeting Westerners, certainly the kidnappings in Lebanon, but Hezbollah's militant activity was by no means, even then in the early years, limited to Lebanon. The first place that we saw Hezbollah acting abroad was not in the West. It wasn't in the United States, it wasn't in Europe. It was in Kuwait. And it was doing this activity not because of anything that was in the Lebanese interest, though Hezbollah has gone to great pains over many years to stress its Lebanese identity, and it is part of the social and political fabric of Lebanese society, but it is also an Iranian proxy, one that over time has moved from being a simple proxy to a full-fledged partner with Iran. That's how U.S. intelligence today, the director of national intelligence and the director of the U.S. National Counterterrorism Center describe this relationship, one that has evolved from a proxy patron relationship into a strategic partnership. One of the individuals who was involved in those bombings in Kuwait back in the early 1980s was a person by the name of Mustafa Badruddin. Mustafa Badruddin's brother-in-law was Imad Mugnia. Imad Mugnia, until he was killed in February 2008 in Syria, was the head of Hezbollah's terrorist and military wings. He's been succeeded by his brother-in-law, the same Mustafa Badruddin. Badruddin was arrested, convicted, actually given a life sentence that was never acted upon, and stayed in a Kuwaiti jail until the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait when he escaped with the help of Iran, the embassy in Kuwait, and then he went to Iran and from there to Lebanon. You might have heard his name, Mustafa Badruddin, more recently in the press because he is the chief person among the four who have been indicted by the UN's special tribunal for Lebanon, The Hague, which is investigating the murder of former Lebanese Prime Minister Rafi Hariri. We'll get back to that later, the fact that four Hezbollah officers including one of the most senior Hezbollah officers, has been indicted by the UN Tribunal for the assassination of Rafi Kariri. So you have the re main representative of Lebanon's Shia, not the only, but the main, certainly in their own mind, being accused with assassinating the de facto head of the Sunni community in Lebanon. We'll get back to that. After the Kuwait bombings, you had the kidnappings in Lebanon, and then we now know from declassified documents the State Department in the United States and the CIA both were writing at the time in the mid-19 and late 1980s about how Hezbollah was pivoting towards Europe. We saw, of course, the hijacking of TWA-847, a U.S. airliner that was a flight intended to be from Greece to Rome, hijacked, diverted. Uh, one American was shot in the head, his body thrown in the tarmac. But this was an act of terrorism that started in Europe, targeted not only Americans, but Europeans. And it was not the end, but the beginning. Not only in terms of the number of attacks and plots that happened throughout Europe in the 1980s through early 1990s, but in terms of some of the characters. One of the main people involved in the TWA 847 hijacking was Mohammed Hamadi, who we believe is the individual who actually shot the American in the head and threw his body in the tarmac. He comes up again just a few years later, in Germany. He was arrested by German authorities in Frankfurt Airport, together with his brother, Abbas, because he was carrying explosives on his person. Authorities believed that the explosives were intended for Fuad Saleh, who at the time was orchestrating a series of Hezbollah bombings in Paris. You may recall that there was a long string of bombings in 1985 and 1986 in France, orchestrated by Fuad Saleh. He's arrested for the expressly criminal act of transferring explosives across international borders. His brother's released because there was no evidence that he was involved and he wasn't carrying the explosives. His brother goes back to Lebanon and immediately orchestrates the kidnapping of two West German businessmen in Lebanon in an effort to pressure the West German government to release his brother who was carrying explosives. The government does not release Mohammed Hamadi 
And so Abbas decides to take it upon himself to come back to Germany and try and carry out an act of terrorism to pressure the government, only he's then arrested as well. There are a host of other attacks, hijacking in Africa, a variety of kidnappings tied just to this case here in Germany of Mohammed Hamadi. In fact, if you look in the 1980s in particular, but well beyond, Hezbollah's activities in Europe in general and in Germany in particular have a long history. Paris in 1983, an arrest of an operative who was plotting an attack, we believe, in Rome, but was arrested in Zurich in 1984. Arrests in Spain in 1985, in Copenhagen later that year. The Paris bombings I mentioned in 85 and 86. An arrest in Italy in 1987. And then attacks or plots or events tied to Hezbollah in Germany in 1987, 1989, 1992, 1997, 2008, 2009. Let's talk about those for a minute because I imagine there's some interest seeing as we're sitting here in Berlin. As I mentioned, in January 1987, Mohammed Hamadi is arrested at Frankfurt International Airport. But in June 1989, there's a whole different plot here in Germany involving Bassam Maki. Bassam Maki was uh, surveilled by German intelligence. They intercepted packages that he was sending back to his handlers in Lebanon that were in code. They broke the code and the letters were mostly about cars. He just kept writing about BMWs and, and Mercedes. And eventually they cracked the code. Uh, uh, a reference to BMW meant an Israeli or a Jewish target. Uh, a reference to a Mercedes was a reference to an American target. These German court documents are publicly available. I, I got them for, for my book, for example. Bassam Maki is arrested. He served his time, he, just a few years, went back to Lebanon. He did not stop his terrorist activity. He was later involved in activities in South America. He was arrested in North America, a long history, but I won't go into it now because after this he wasn't involved in Europe. In September 1992, we have the infamous attack on the Mykonos restaurant where Hezbollah carried out an attack on Iranian Kurdish dissidents at the behest of Iran. There were in fact a whole host of such attacks across Europe, but Mykonos was not only here, it was also the most famous. Then in 1997, there was the arrest of Stefan Smirek, a German convert to Islam, to Shia Islam, who volunteered himself for Hezbollah's services. And at first they didn't want to take him. They were worried that he was a German spy trying to infiltrate Hezbollah. So they made him come to Beirut first, and they asked him all kinds of questions, and they wouldn't let him in. Eventually they did. He went to training. They sent him back home, and they decided to use him as one of a group of several individuals that they intended to infiltrate into Israel via Europe primarily, in one case via Southeast Asia, a Malaysian, to carry out intelligence activities, surveillance, or bombings in Israel. This is, of course, after the signing of the Oslo Accords. For those of us, like myself, who believe in a two-state solution, the Oslo Accords were a very positive step in the right direction. Unfortunately, it's not moving very well right now. The people who were upset when it was moving well was Iran and Hezbollah. And they set out to do what they could to undermine uh, this, 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 this progress towards peace. First, they sent Hussein Mcdad, a Lebanese citizen who had very Caucasian European looks. Uh, they got him a false passport, a British passport. Uh, uh, it was actually a real passport that a, a British citizen had lost on a camping trip to France. Hezbollah procured the passport on the black market. He then flew to Vienna, where I was yesterday. He and his handler, they went from the airport directly to the train station, where they met a third Hezbollah operative, and it's unclear if that Hezbollah operative was resident in Austria, if he was resident somewhere else in Europe, if he came in from Lebanon or someplace else just for this meeting, we don't know. But he provided the false passport. Magdad traveled to Vienna on his real passport. He then took a train to Zurich, spent a couple of days walking around the lake, practicing his cover identity, memorizing the names and phone numbers of the people who would be his contacts in East Jerusalem, Palestinians who would provide him with precursor explosives. He then flies on a Swiss air flight from Zurich to Tel Aviv. The Israelis knew nothing about it. Americans, Swiss, none of us knew anything about it until he made a mistake putting together the explosives and lost an eye and several fingers when the explosives went off in his East Jerusalem hotel room. 
At first, the authorities thought that it was a gas leak, but then they found the, the explosive residue, and they put the case together. There's actually a tremendous amount of evidence available on the McDodd case. He allowed um, a documentary filmmaker to come in and do a documentary about him when he was in an Israeli prison. He was since traded in one of the Israeli Hezbollah prison swaps, as for that matter was Stefan Smirik. Fauzi Ayub did the same. Gerard Schumann did the same. There were five individuals who were infiltrated mostly through Europe into Israel for the purpose of collecting intelligence for attacks and actually carrying out attacks. 1997 was the case of Stefan Smirik, a German citizen. <clears throat> In 2002-2003, you had a very interesting uh, scenario. This was, of course, after 9-11. And at 9-11, Hezbollah made a very conscious decision to do as much as possible to stay out of the crosshairs of the war on terrorism. Hezbollah did not want to be brought into that for obvious reasons. And so they curtailed much of their international activity and limited their international activity to fundraising, weapons procurement, things that they could do undercover, and support for Palestinian groups. One of the things they did is decided to try and beef up their presence in Europe. Hezbollah was now involved in politics. It wasn't in control of the government as it is today, but you had Hezbollah parliamentarians in the Lebanese parliament. And so Hezbollah approached several European countries, including Germany, in 2002 and 2003, asking formal permission to set up a political office in those countries. Every one of them said no. Hezbollah also, parenthetically, uh, at one point tried to buy a, a building here in, here in Berlin, uh, which they were not allowed to do, but that's another story. In July 2008, uh, the Israelis arrested an Israeli Arab medical student, that is to say, an Arab citizen of Israel who was here in Germany studying medicine, um, who was recruited by someone affiliated with the Orphan Children Project in Lebanon, a charity that has since been closed because it was functioning here in Germany as the local branch of the Al Shahid, the Martyrs Foundation, the Hezbollah uh, Foundation that raises money for the organization. But it wasn't just raising money. This Israeli Arab medical student, Khaled Kashkush, was recruited for Hezbollah operations here in Germany by a spotter who was looking out for potential recruits here in Germany. This is not in the early or mid or late 1980s. This is not in the early, mid, or late 1990s. This is in July 2008. So we're talking now. Germany actually has more cases where it has investigated Hezbollah than any other European country. And that is because it has a larger Hezbollah presence than any other European country. And the government is very open about this. The government, the intelligence agency's annual reports first reported 850, then 900, then 1,000 people who are operatives or supporters, supporters somewhere on that spectrum of people who support or do things on behalf of Hezbollah. But because Hezbollah is not a banned organization in Germany, because Hezbollah is not a designated organization in the European Union, there are only two countries that have banned all or part of Hezbollah. The Netherlands, which has banned all of Hezbollah, and the United Kingdom, which has banned well, first they banned just the terrorist wing, and then a couple of years ago they banned the military wing as well. We'll get back to that in a minute. Because they're not banned or designated, most European countries have a very hard time legally opening up investigations about Hezbollah because of Hezbollah's activities as a terrorist group. They can investigate any criminal activity that Hezbollah engages in, and the good news for us, the bad news for Hezbollah, is that they're involved in a tremendous amount of criminal activity, from petty crime like credit card fraud and cigarette smuggling to all kinds of fraud involving used car sales and much, much more. What they're involved in now, and this is a relatively recent phenomenon and in, in the extent to which they're involved in it, is narcotics trafficking. Not producing drugs, but moving and laundering the proceeds of drugs. We'll get back to that in a second, too. But we do have lots of cases about Hezbollah in the United States because Hezbollah has been designated as a terrorist group by the State Department and the Treasury Department for many years. And so in the United States, there are Hezbollah investigations that are not just focused on illicit conduct. 
You can open up an investigation into Hezbollah in the United States whether or not you happen to see them violating standard laws. Let me give you an example of something we were able to uncover in the United States involving Germany. Again, I don't want anybody to think that the history of Hezbollah in this country is only about things that happened in the 1980s or 1990s. Let's talk about something that was revealed in 2009. FBI in the Philadelphia area has an opportunity with a cooperating witness who's a Lebanese in America, I think he was also an American citizen, who was a low-level criminal and because of that was serving, uh, he got in trouble with the law, he was serving as a cooperating witness with the FBI. And he's approached by another Lebanese criminal from Lebanon, not from the United States, wanting to do some business. And he poses as a low-level street thug for a Philadelphia mafia crime boss. This begins a long saga of a Hezbollah scheme involving all kinds of different crime in the Philadelphia area, from stolen cell phones, stolen PlayStations, counterfeit sporting goods, sneakers, and, and team jerseys, uh, uh, counterfeit money sales, selling stolen money, a whole host of different things, including also efforts to procure weapons in the United States for Hezbollah. So it was in part a fundraising scheme through crime and in part a weapons procurement scheme. We'll leave the fundraising scheme aside for now. It's, a, it's an entirely different, amazing, but different story. Plus, if I tell you everything now, you'll have no interest in buying my book when it comes out. <clears throat> We'll focus now on the story of Danny Tariff. Danny Tariff is a dual Lebanese-German citizen who lived until he found himself in an American jail here in Germany and had a company, an import-export company called Power Express in Slovakia. He also happened to be acting as a Hezbollah procurement agent, procuring weapons and other stuff and sending it to Hezbollah through his import-export company, Power Express. To make a very long story short, he gets involved in this, and because he gets involved, he's now working with an FBI cooperating witness. We now send in some FBI undercover agents, and the next thing you know, he's inviting the cooperating witness to Slovakia to tour his facility, boasting about how he can get anything he wants to Hezbollah. He'll send it through the Syrian port of Latakia, and the Syrian intelligence will close down part of the port. Hezbollah gets to use it anytime they want. There's no customs inspection, but just in case you're worried, don't worry. Here's how I will change the paperwork so it'll look like it's not weapons, it'll be agricultural material. He comes to the United States, meets with the undercover, meets with the cooperating witness, once and then a second time to secure the deal. He talks about wanting to procure not just automatic rifles, which was what he was first interested in, but something, as he put it, to take down an F-15. He wants shoulder-fired missiles. So the FBI gets some shoulder-fired missiles and changes them a little bit so they won't work. And he comes and he looks at them, and he's impressed, and he's happy, and he puts it on his shoulder, and he poses with it. We know this because we have the pictures. They're on the internet. You can get them. It's, this is all open information. And then once he signs the contract, he's arrested. This is a German national procuring shoulder-fired missiles for Hezbollah for the purpose of taking down aircraft. This is serious stuff. Now, believe me, by the way, I'm not trying to say that Germany has somehow a bigger problem than the United States or other countries. Hezbollah is resident in lots of different places. There's a significant Hezbollah presence in the United States despite everything that we do. That just means that we have a greater challenge and we need every tool that we can possibly get to deal with this threat. And I'd like to propose that the threat is more severe today than it has been for a very long time and that there is a greater need today than perhaps ever before to do a lot of different things, including a European designation of Hezbollah. By that I mean not only a European Union, EU designation of Hezbollah, which is difficult to do because the EU is a 27-member body that works by consensus. Everybody needs to agree. But also individual member states. 
European countries within and frankly without the EU, each of whom have their own sovereign responsibilities to protect their citizens and to protect their financial systems from being abused uh, by these types of schemes. Let me give you, paint four pictures for you of the types of illicit conduct Hezbollah is engaged in. But before I do it, let me say again, because I want to be clear, Hezbollah is lots of things. Hezbollah has multiple identities. And I'm not pretending that Hezbollah is not part of the social fabric of Lebanese society. It is. And that does make this more complicated. And it is part of the political system. In fact, it dominates the political system in Lebanon today. That is a truth. And the fact that it's elected, duly elected within a democratic system in Lebanon, that does make things more complicated. I'm not trying to pretend that that's not a real issue. And it does provide social welfare support that the government cannot or will not provide in Lebanon. But it also maintains a militia that is larger and better armed than most countries with tens of thousands of missiles in explicit violation of UN Security Council resolutions. And it also engages in international crime and international terrorism. And these activities are explicitly illegal under any definition. And what I'm saying is that we cannot forgive or whitewash Hezbollah's terrorism or criminal activities simply because it is also involved in open activities like providing social welfare support or serving in a government. One does not exclude the other. The opposite is the case. We need to force a decision by Hezbollah. You have to choose. You cannot do both. Imagine a politician in any Western democracy being a murderer and saying, no, no, you can't touch me. I'm a, I'm a politician. There's no such immunity. Let me give you some examples of the types of activity Hezbollah is involved in. And when I think of it, I put it into four basic bins, four basic baskets an international security threat, an organized criminal threat, a regional security threat, and perhaps contrary to conventional wisdom, a power that is undermining stability in Lebanon. Let me tell you what I mean. I told you about some of these attacks or plots here in Germany in the 1980s. Hezbollah then tried to do lots of other things. It did bomb the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires in 92 and the AMIA Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires two years later. A few weeks before that second attack in Buenos Aires, it came this close to blowing up the Israeli embassy in Bangkok. There are a whole host of things over the years that Hezbollah has done in places that most people have no idea that they've been involved in, in Africa, in Southeast Asia. Incredible stuff. You get it by the book. <clears throat> But for a period of time, Hezbollah really did scale back its international terrorist activity. It would be willing to train others. Hezbollah was training Iraqi Shia militants, for example. Hezbollah was even, according to the United Nations Monitoring Committee, training Somali Shabab. The Sunni Somali Shabab tied to Al-Qaeda was being trained by Hezbollah in Lebanon. In fact, some of them got stuck in Lebanon during the July 2006 war, which I think is surprising to many because Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda don't always love each other, but yet they've cooperated in more than one instance, especially when it comes to training. But today, today Hezbollah is involved in terrorist activity worldwide. You have Hezbollah being indicted in The Hague for the assassination of Rafiq Hariri at home. There is no way that can be explained as being in the interest of Lebanon. There is no way... Hezbollah can explain that it, which, and it describes itself as being part and parcel of Lebanon, putting Lebanon first. This is not putting Lebanon first. This is acting in the interests of others. Hezbollah has been accused of carrying out a successful attack in Burgas, Bulgaria, and of plotting to do an almost identical attack in Bulgaria, but on the other side of the country, six months earlier, also targeting Israeli tourists, though in that case, that January, the tourists were going there to ski, not to go to the beaches. They've been accused of plotting two different attacks targeting Israeli tourists in Cyprus and an attack in Thailand. And in one of the attacks, bless you, in one of the attacks in Cyprus and in the plot in Thailand, the two Hezbollah operatives who were plotting actual attacks were European citizens. Both of them were Swedish citizens. So we now have Hezbollah 
engaged in acts of terrorism abroad and in Europe and using European operatives today. Hezbollah is an international security threat in the immediate, not in the conceptual. A, by the way, why they're doing that, we can talk about that during the questions and answer if you want. That's a very interesting story. And separate from that, separate from this effort to target Israeli tourists worldwide, they are still trying to carry out an attack against a senior Israeli or senior Jewish target in retaliation for the uh, February 2008 assassination of Hezbollah arch terrorist Imad Mugnia, something for which they blame the Israelis. Right after that, at the, uh, at the funeral, Nasrallah, via video link, uh, promised Israel an open war, meaning beyond the borders of Lebanon. And indeed, Hezbollah tried to carry out attacks in Baku, Azerbaijan, in Egypt, and three different times in Turkey, among others. By the way, I, I mentioned uh, Bulgaria twice, Cyprus. There are other places, too, some of which haven't really made it into the media. For example, a thwarted attack that was planned at the Johannesburg airport by Hezbollah. So you have a, a, a serious international security threat. And just those few instances I'm talking about, you have now Europe, Asia, and Africa, just to start with. It's not like they're even focusing on one particular region. A. B. Hezbollah has historically been involved in more criminal activity than any other terrorist organization with the exception of Colombia's FARC. And the FARC today is involved in so much crime that it is no longer a terrorist group that also engages in criminal activity. It is a criminal drug trafficking organization that also engages in terrorism, which leaves Hezbollah as the primary terrorist organization involved in crime today. And that's historical and very, very well documented. Today, however, Hezbollah is involved in more criminal activity than ever before. In part, this is because Hezbollah fears that Iran may no longer be a reliable source of funds forever. We believe that Iran gives Hezbollah approximately $200 million a year, plus a little bit more from time to time, such as after the July 2006 war. But at least twice now, we believe that Iran has had to cut back its funding for Hezbollah quite suddenly in 2009. And you might have seen some of the press reports just a couple of weeks ago where there's speculation that the sanctions targeting Iran over its nuclear program may actually also be curtailing its ability to finance Hezbollah. And even though I don't think it's particularly likely that there'll be some type of grand bargain with Iran, Hezbollah is not taking any chances. And they are diversifying their portfolio. And part of their diversification is diversifying into crime because there is tremendous amount of money to be made. Nowhere more so than in what the United Nations estimates is the $320 billion a year narcotics industry. Let's be clear, Hezbollah is not producing drugs. But Hezbollah is moving drugs and Hezbollah is laundering the proceeds of drugs. For several years, there wasn't a whole lot about this out in the open source domain. There was a little bit. There was Operation Titan in Colombia, where Colombian authorities and the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration cracked down on 18 Hezbollah members in Colombia, led by Shekri Harb, a Hezbollah guy who went by the nickname Taliban because he thought it was cool. But very little was said about the Hezbollah connection. None of the legal documents in Colombia said Hezbollah. None of the DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, or U.S. Treasury documents said Hezbollah. If you interviewed and went and talked to officials privately, they would talk about it, but nothing public. A little bit more of that has come out. But what now has flooded the open source domain is information about the Lebanese Canadian Bank, information about Ayman Juma and the networks that he ran in South America, moving narcotics from South America, not into Miami, not into the Caribbean, but straight across the 10th parallel that narrowest point between South America and West Africa, what we call in the business Highway 10, the 10th parallel, moving the product straight across from South America to Africa and then up from Africa, not only to the Middle East, but Southern Europe. And believe me, while Hezbollah is not designated within any of those European countries in Southern Europe and is not designated within the European Union, when you go to those countries and you say, hey, I've got some Hezbollah guys who are moving drugs into your country. 
believe me, you have their attention. Now, the newspapers may not report that there was a bust of a Hezbollah cell. The newspapers may only report that it was a bust of drug smugglers, and that's fine with me, because they're one and the same. My problem is that if you really want to tackle the problem, you can't come at it from only one direction and hope that you will always uncover their criminal activity. That's one great way of uncovering their activity and tackling them, but you also need to come at them from an intelligent side. And if Hezbollah is not a banned entity, you can't do that. So there's an increased international security threat. There is an increased amount of activity of organized crime, including here in Europe. But now you have Hezbollah acting as a massive source of regional instability. They'd already been doing this for some time. You heard mention of John Brennan, the White House counterterrorism advisor's talk a week ago Friday in Ireland, or among other things he mentioned is the fact that Hezbollah is moving weapons to the Houthi rebels in Yemen on behalf of Iran. That's regional instability. They'd been doing this type of thing for much earlier. As I mentioned, they were training Iraqi militants during the Iraq war, sometimes in Iran, sometimes in Hezbollah. But guess what? They weren't only training them. Ali Musa Dakduk and others, senior Hezbollah commanders in, in, in Iraq, were involved in plotting attacks targeting British forces. That's the reason why the United Kingdom expanded their designation of Hezbollah from just the terrorist wing to the military wing as well. Not because of anything Hezbollah was doing targeting Israel. Not because of anything Hezbollah was doing in Lebanon and certainly not because of anything Hezbollah was doing in London but because Hezbollah was targeting British forces in Iraq. Explain to me what that has to do with the best interests of Lebanon, Hezbollah as a political party. This was being done at the behest of Iran. Remember, US intelligence describes this now as a strategic partnership. Today, what Hezbollah is doing in the region in Syria makes what they do in Yemen and what they did in the past in Iraq look like child's play. Let me be blunt. Hezbollah is helping the Assad regime butcher Syrian people. The United States government has redesignated Hezbollah again. They've long been designated a terrorist group, but designated them again to expose their support for the regime of Bashar al-Assad. When they did that, they declassified intelligence that A, this is not new. It's expanded this support, but it's been going on since the very beginning of this crisis. And B, that this is not some rogue element, not some breakaway wing, that this is being orchestrated by Hassan Nasrallah himself, the Secretary General of Hezbollah. And since that action, more evidence has come out that Hezbollah is not just providing support and training, but they are actually killing people. They are providing snipers. They are shooting short-range rockets from the Lebanon's, Lebanese side of the border at Syrian villages and towns just over the border that are no longer controlled by the regime, targeting Syrian uh, rebels. Butchering Syrian civilians. This is A, a tragedy for Syrian people. B, it is dragging the conflict over the border into Lebanon. And what is going to happen, if it hasn't happened already, and you could make the debate that it already is, is that we're not going to be dealing with a rebellion or a civil war. We're going to be dealing with a regional sectarian conflict between Sunnis and Shia and their relative allies. And with that, if that happens, we will be experiencing a bloodbath that could consume the region, not only in Syria and not only in Lebanon, but beyond. And in this way, Hezbollah is already undermining the stability of Lebanon. You heard some of the reasons that people tend to say why we can't designate Hezbollah as a terrorist group within Europe. One of the reasons, an additional reason, is they say, we're worried about what it might do to the stability of Lebanon. Hezbollah is already doing plenty to, do, to destabilize Lebanon. The Hezbollah-led government has an official government position of non-intervention in Syria. And Hezbollah, which leads the coalition, is in Syria killing people. And the impact on Lebanon is clear. Kidnappings here, kidnappings there. Firefights from the Dahya, Hezbollah's controlled, uh, dominated neighborhood in South Beirut, all the way north to Tripoli. 
The potential for destabilizing Lebanon politically, well, that's already happened. The potential for a bloodbath is increasing day by day. And so I think today, given Hezbollah's international terrorism targeting civilians worldwide, and by the way, they're targeting Israelis, they're not only killing Israelis. I personally don't make a distinction between one government's citizens and another. I don't care if you're an Israeli citizen or a Bulgarian citizen, killing civilians is beyond the pale. What's so complicated about that message, I don't know. I think we should be designating all of Hezbollah because failure to do so means they'd continue to raise money through whatever part of Hezbollah is not designated. And Sheikh Naim Qasim, the deputy chief of Hezbollah, says all the time, he wrote it in his book, which is in English, and he said it just a week and a half ago again. Don't listen to Matt Levitt. Listen to the deputy chief of Hezbollah. There is no distinction between our wings. But if within the 27-member system of the EU, where everybody needs to agree, if some people feel that they cannot designate all of Hezbollah, because that would include designating the political branch of Hezbollah, which is duly elected and they're uncomfortable with that. By the way, I say, get over it. Nasrallah is overseeing what's happening in Syria. But fine, if they're uncomfortable with that, then there is a moral, ethical imperative, beyond the security imperative, beyond the law enforcement imperative, a moral, ethical imperative, at a minimum, to designate the terrorist and military wings of Hezbollah, what is so complicated about sending Hezbollah the message that targeting civilians, killing civilians, is not acceptable? What is controversial about that? I just don't understand. We collectively provide Hezbollah a get out of jail free card. Because they do some things that are okay, we're forgiving them for all the things that they're doing that are in no way okay. And I don't understand it. When I started this project uh, for this book, it happened because I went to a U.S. government-sponsored conference. It wasn't open like this. It was by invitation only for current and former government people. At that point, I was out of government. Each of the panels on Lebanon and Hezbollah were chaired by a U.S. government official. And the panelists were Shia professors in the United States, people who were brought in from Lebanon, all kinds of very interesting people. On several of these panels, people said things like, I know America and Israel say there's a guy named Imad Mugnia, but I've never met him and I don't believe he exists. I know people say that Hezbollah did bombings in Argentina, but I just don't believe it. And on each of these panels, the US government officials said nothing. And I'm sitting there in the audience wanting to rip my hair out. As soon as they opened it up for questions and answers, everybody in the audience kind of jumped up at once and said, you need to know your audience. You may not know that Imad Mugnia exists, we are all current or former U.S. government analysts. We do. He ex well, he doesn't anymore. But at the time, he did exist. And so I thought to myself, you know what? If a person wanted to know about the overt public sides of Hezbollah, politics, charity and social welfare support, even the militia activity, kidnapping Israeli soldiers across the blue line, firing rockets into Israel, all that kind of stuff, there's plenty to read about it. There are a bunch of books about it. Some of them are even good. A bunch are not. But if you want to understand about Hezbollah's explicitly terrorist activity, if you want to know what they're doing abroad, there is nothing. And so I started a process that took seven years. And you can't just Google this. So I started traveling the world. I came to Berlin. I went all over the place. I lived near Washington, D.C., and so I benefited from people coming to me. And it was amazing. When you started asking nicely, suddenly, from Chile to Singapore, from the Philippines to Canada to Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, Romania, and everywhere in between, people were willing to share information. And that's what this book is going to end up being. May it please be published soon in our time. I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and have this conversation with you. As you can see, I, I have a little bit of a passion about the subject. You don't have to agree with me. You just have to be willing to engage in a conversation with me. You're here, and so I appreciate that very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew Levitt, for this really interesting speech.
So let me just uh, ask you a direct question. You, um, I, I, I think you were here uh, talking to uh, people from the government, and I guess you have more experience with politicians and governments in Europe talking about uh, Hezbollah. So what's your impression? Um, why is there still this reluctance to designate Hezbollah as a terrorist organization? What are the arguments and what's perhaps behind it? How much time do we have? <laughs> well, let me start with the good news, which is really bad news. The good news is that I have never received so much, I don't know if it's fair to always say, though in some instances, interest, but at least willingness to seriously have this conversation than ever before. And this is an issue I've been talking with people about here for years now. That's the good news. It's bad news because the, willing, the reason they're willing to have this conversation is because of all the things that we've been talking about. There's no longer a debate. Is Hezbollah doing terrorism internationally? Is Hezbollah in Europe? I mean, this, this is a moot point. This is over, right? Even in the case of the uh, Burgas Bulgaria attack, where it's not clear if they necessarily will be able to put together a law enforcement case at the end of the day. First of all, I don't know who they'd put on trial because the suicide bomber is no longer. But second of all, Hezbollah is very capable, and there's very little evidence left behind. That happens sometimes. But you have someone from Europe, a Swedish citizen, a dual Swedish-Lebanese citizen, who is facing trial right now in Cyprus at a time when Cyprus holds the rotating presidency of the European Union. So when I was in Brussels a couple of weeks ago and you walk down every hallway, every single hallway, if you've ever been there, you know, is decorated with tourism posters of whichever country holds the rotating presidency. So you walk down a hallway and you've, you've passed now 15, 20 Cyprus posters, you get the message. Cyprus has the rotating presidency. That, there, there's some interest there. Now there are still concerns. One concern is, as I said, can you and should you designate a duly elected uh, party in a sovereign state? That's a, that's a legitimate debate. I'm willing to debate that with anybody anytime. Um, that's one point. On that point, I will both argue that yes, you can and yes, you should. And I'll also argue, as I just did, that if you can't or won't, that, it's not a, 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 uh, a yes or no proposition. You could at least do what the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, and other countries have done, which is to designate part of the group. By the way, it's very interesting. If you look at some of these designations, and they're all available on the internet, New Zealand, when it designated Hezbollah, pointed to a whole bunch of things, including the 2008 attempted bombing in Baku, Azerbaijan, and other things internationally. But New Zealand also pointed to the uh, 2008 takeover of downtown Beirut. Again, Hezbollah no longer in any way could you describe this as acting in the interest of Lebanon. Several people were killed when Hezbollah turned the weapons that it supposedly collects only for resistance activity targeting Israel, the, the Zionist entity, against fellow Lebanese. That was one of the predicates that New Zealand used to designate Hezbollah. There are a host of other, other, other reasons, too, that people are, are, are not sure about it. Uh, again, would it destabilize uh, Lebanon? Um, but one of the things that is the biggest frustration to me is the chicken and egg question. <clears throat> when you go to the EU, <clears throat> often people will say to you, well, listen, we're a 27-member body and we work by consensus, and we can't put things forward. We need our member states to put things forward. So go talk to the member states, and then they can drive this forward. So then you go and talk to the member states, and the member states say, no, no, we believe in the EU system, you see. We don't want to do things ourselves. We need the EU to do it. Sometimes I think it's people not understanding the process. I met with one EU official who said, well, a reason we don't do this is because we need a law enforcement case where Hezbollah is indicted and convicted for terrorism charges in, the, in Europe. Well, there are two problems with that. One, it's very hard to convict Hezbollah on terrorism charges if Hezbollah is not considered a terrorist group. And B, as the designation expert from the EU who was in that meeting added, it's not true. You don't, under the EU guidelines, need a conviction. It just would make it more convenient. Um, and so you have this chicken and egg scenario. And what I've been telling the EU, and I've been telling member states both, there's an, a, a pan-European uh, equity interests in this. 
And when I spoke to them recently, they agreed, and they're interested in this for a variety of reasons. We don't know, for example, who exactly assassinated General Wissam al-Hassan in Lebanon a couple of weeks ago, the uh, Lebanese intelligence chief, who was doing some very, very brave things, investigating Syrian plots to do bombings in Lebanon, the Samhara investigation, supporting the Special Tribunal for Lebanon investigation, of uh, looking into the assassination of Rafi Kariri. But I've spoken to several European officials who had met with him in the weeks before he was killed. He brought his family to Paris, and he told all these European officials, mark my words, Hezbollah is trying to kill me. We don't know that it was Hezbollah. They are a suspect. We don't know, let me be clear. And I have no inside information here. But there are a whole host of things going on right now. And I tell EU member states, you're still sovereign states. You still have not only the authority, but the responsibility to provide for the security of your citizenry, to protect your economic uh, foundation from abuse. Hezbollah is presenting a threat to you. They are engaging in criminal activity here. Those are violations of your laws. No one's asking you to do anything special there other than enforce your own laws. It's illegal to traffic drugs and launder the proceeds of drugs anywhere in Europe. You need no new authority for that. And to the extent that they're doing things in Europe, that's a problem, and I'd argue it's a problem for any European country. And if you really want to poke it to them, you say, is it not enough that they're doing things in Bulgaria and Cyprus? Are you going to wait till they do things here? Is that what it is? It's going to have to be too? God forbid. So again, there's lots of concern and hesitancy and questions about authority. But there is an interest in looking at this anew. And let me also be clear, the goal here is not a designation of Hezbollah. A designation of Hezbollah is a tool. I think it's an effective tool. It enables you to seize money. It enables you to ban travel. It also is a shot across the bow, indicating to Hezbollah you have to make a choice. You cannot muddy the waters between legitimate and illegitimate activities and expect to get away with it anymore, period. And tangibly, as you said in your introduction, it does empower countries to open up Hezbollah terrorism investigations in a way that most European countries today cannot and do not. <clears throat> one more question. Uh, I mean, so in the ah. uh, one more question, question uh, by me. In case, let's say, there would be a European designation or a designation by important countries in Europe, um, what would be the impact for Hezbollah and for their masters in Tehran? What, would, what are the most important things? Well, like I said, first of all, these authorities enable you to seize money and they enable you to ban travel. And that's significant. As I said, in 2002, 2003, they were very interested in opening up political offices here. If Hezbollah parliamentarians and others are banned from travel to Europe, the message is going to be loud and clear. And, and there is money to be seized here in Germany and elsewhere. It would not be the first time Germany banned Hezbollah's satellite television station, Al Manar, the Ministry of Interior. Germany shut down the Orphan Welfare Project, which was operating as part of Hezbollah's Martyrs Foundation. A court in Dusseldorf a few years ago uh, denied the renewal of a visa to an individual from Lebanon. And, the, and the, the basis for that was that he was a member of a terrorist organization, Hezbollah, which was amazing since Hezbollah is not legally considered a terrorist organization in Germany or within the, within the EU. But it would also signal that we are now collectively forcing Hezbollah to make a change. If it's just the United States and Israel and a few countries that are seen as especially close to the United States, Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Canada, the Five Eyes, then frankly Hezbollah is able to say it's all a Zionist conspiracy. I mean, if it rains and it's a cloudy day, it's a Zionist conspiracy. But if others get involved, if Europe gets involved, then that would be a huge sign. It would also deny Hezbollah the ability to move and operate as freely as they do in Europe. Let me be blunt. Hezbollah raises money in Europe today like it's the Red Cross. And it's just as legal to do it because it's not a banned entity. Okay, so let's start. Um, 
we have two persons here, so I start with you and then with you. My name is Dieter Wolf, I'm a journalist here in Berlin. Uh, I uh, was wondering if you could, uh, since you were mentioning the various countries, um, one of them uh, which was not included in your um, list just now, that is the Netherlands, and maybe if you can, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, expand on why do you think that they took the stand they did, uh, second, I wonder if you could um, maybe go a little bit more into, st into specifying different countries. You were more in general talking about Europe. I mean, what is, in your view, specifically the situation uh, in Germany here, since we're in Germany right now? Um, in the case of um, Iran, um, there has been for years, in the way I see it, a very... Um, different perspective in Germany than in to many other European countries uh, regarding uh, how to look how to look at Iran and I wonder if you if you see a, a similarity there uh, in the way uh, Germany looks at this uh, thank you okay. perhaps we take one more and select. Um. Very often I hear uh, about the idea, mainly from uh, left people, um, they're really in love with the idea of uh, taming uh, terrorist wings of organizations by acknowledging uh, the political wing. And uh, an example of apparently successful um, strategy is um, Sinn Féin and the um, IRA in Ireland. And I would, I wonder if you hear that example too in your discussions, and uh, how do you argue against um, the, the comparison between uh, those two cases, between Irish and Hezbollah? Okay, I'm gonna try and do this briefly so we can get to the other questions, but the first question in particular is kind of three very big, very good, but very big questions. Um, the Netherlands took a principled position. That's the, the main bottom line. And the, the Netherlands reports, and which I don't remember the year, um, but I think it was a couple of years ago. I, I don't remember offhand. You, know, you write a book that's this large and suddenly you can't remember many, most details. Um, but this is all public. You can go home after this and Google it and it'll all come up. And you can pull up both in Dutch and in English, I don't know if they do it in German too, uh, but the uh, analytical reports where they describe their view on the AIVD, their uh, intelligence service view on, on these issues. But I believe it's principally a, a, a principled position. There are some other issues that I don't think they mention, but there has been reports of surveillance of the STL facility in The Hague, which is ironic in a way because the facility is the former headquarters of the AIVD. Um, but I think that principally it was a, a, an issue not on anything that they were necessarily doing uh, in the Netherlands. Um, we don't have time to, to go into all the details of what Hezbollah and where Hezbollah is doing in Europe. Um, I have a tremendous amount of stuff on this in the book, but also a lot of it is historical. You know, I'm, I'm, you are, I'm not a journalist. And so one of the things that I told government officials when I met with them, and a lot of my information for my interviews is from government officials, <clears throat> often they could provide documents, but for things that were more current, they couldn't. One of the things I would tell them is, look, I'm not interested in necessarily making public everything you tell me. I'm not a journalist. I'm a former law enforcement and, and intelligence officer. The last thing I want to do is expose an ongoing investigation. So. A lot of the stuff in the book will be historical, not necessarily ancient history. You have examples here from 2008, 2009, um, but not necessarily stuff that was happening last week either. But the point is, in a nutshell, Hezbollah has a larger support network in Germany than anywhere else in Europe. It also has uh, historically engaged in activities and or had engaged in support activities 
uh, almost everywhere in Europe. Almost everywhere in Europe. Um, I was very surprised, for example, to find about their activities in Romania, including a hijacking that I think very, very few people know about. Fauzi Ayub, one of the individuals who was infiltrated into Israel to carry out an attack, infiltrated through Europe, in his case through Greece, but on a forged American passport, who had previously lived in Canada. Before that, he was one of the people who was uh, arrested for engaging in an attempted hijacking of an Iraqi airliner out of Romania, which was done at the behest of Iran because they were still angry over it was just the tail end of the Iran-Iraq war. Um, but very, very broad over the years. And not all of it has to be resident here, by the way. Because it, it was so easy for Hezbollah to come here and travel here, and it's so close, they're able to do a lot of things here while not, while not being based here. <clears throat> On Iran, First of all, yes, Germany has traditionally had a somewhat different view than some other countries on Iran. Though, again, you see significant changes there. The uh, oil and gas uh, sanctions uh, are, are very, very significant and powerful, and Germany got behind that. Germany has a particularly acute interest in trade. That's just a fact. This is a country that produces and exports to its credit. That's why it's so powerful economically and doing so well even hard times to its credit. But we have a situation now where so much of the Iranian economy is controlled by the Revolutionary Guard um, that it is frankly impossible to be able to state with any type of certainty that any business with Iran is not business with the Revolutionary Guard. That opens up private sector to all kinds of reputational risk and due diligence and fiduciary obligation questions and helps explain why so many banks are doing so little, if any, business with Iran. And it also explains why Siemens and other countries also have uh, experienced uh, a desire to cut back some of their business. And I think that that's only going to continue because Iran is not about to stop muddying these waters, and that is going to force the hand of all countries, public sector and private sector, on this issue. So the first half to the question that you didn't really ask was, I already see a change going on there. It's slow, and there's more that has to be done. But I think that the Germany deserves some credit there. <clears throat> In terms of Hezbollah, the reasons for Germany's view on Hezbollah has, is not to do with its view on, on Iran. That is really a trade issue. The Hezbollah issue was, and to the extent it still is, is tied to these other issues we were discussing. Will this undermine the stability of Lebanon? What would be the authority under which we would do this? Would Germany take evidence to the European Union and try and press other European Union countries for a European Union designation? Or does it have the authority to do so unilaterally? Not all German officials I've spoken to believe that Germany has the unilateral authority to do it. Right? So that's a discussion. That's an important discussion because you have to have an agreement that you have the legal authorities to do it in the way you want to do it. And if not, then to go through the legal and political proceedings to get such an authority. But again, I see significant change, even in the conversations I've had very, very recently. So I think that the fact that there really is no disagreement on the basics, there is disagreement on the, on the periphery. Did Hezbollah really do this? Is it really involved in that? Has it gone this far here? But on the core issues that I've laid out, there is no disagreement today. The facts are the facts. And the only people who can deny those facts are the people who haven't looked at them, haven't asked for them, and those people are primarily not asking for them because they don't want them because if they get them, they're going to be faced with the facts. And so they behind, hide behind the skirt of, I don't know, and they want to keep it that way. I don't think that that's the case in Germany anymore. So I do see a change. Now, in terms of the view among the left, and I would argue some others too, about the ability of taming terrorist groups by acknowledging their political wing, or by virtue of the co-optation that would necessarily happen by their participation in politics, there are lots of examples across the spectrum of political science theory that one can point to for more or less success. Most people point to the IRA Sinn Féin, and I love that because it could not be more flawed. Sinn Féin was not driven by a religious creed that called for the destruction of the United Kingdom. 
By definition, Sinn Féin was amenable to some type of political negotiation. By definition. It also was not, at the same time that it was Irish, it was also not a proxy, maybe now a partner, of an international sponsor of terrorism that would want it to carry out acts of terrorism internationally for completely non-Irish means, uh, non-Irish reasons, as Hezbollah has and does in the case of Iran. Complete apples and oranges. Were it only so simple that Hezbollah was Sinn Féin, it would be a much easier world, but it's not. Um, the fact that U.S. intelligence now openly describes this as the strategic partnership, U.S. officials have told me, is a very significant mood and I can move and I can tell you they're frustrated that people haven't picked up on it. Maybe it's too subtle for, for the public to pick up on. So I'm here to tell you, looking into the camera, this is a big deal. Uh, and this is not based on a, on a whim or a fancy or the winds of change. This is based on their intelligence assessment. Um, I got two questions. Uh, the first one, um, in the late 80s, there were a few middle-level um, Hezbollah members uh, going to North Korea for a few weeks. Uh, can you tell me something about uh, new developments in this area, if there are still contacts? And the other one is, the second one, um, do you see an increasing transfer of their special knowledge, uh, for example, their internal communica uh, communication system or explosives or something like this today? so that they uh, transfer their knowledge to, uh, for example, other terrorist groups or uh, just criminal groups. Thank you. First of all, forgive me for not looking at you as you were speaking. Just I'm beginning to get a crick in my neck. This is a very steep auditorium. Um, can, can I answer those? You want to take more? All right. So I, I, I looked into this issue of uh, the North Korea connection for the book. And in the end, I didn't include it. There's lots of stuff that is mostly speculatory. There is some recent stuff suggesting that there have been Hezbollah people in North Korea more recently. I simply can't verify it. The, what took the longest with this book wasn't necessarily the collecting of information, though that certainly took time, but it was the vetting of information. In other words, you find something in the newspaper, you find something in a, in a journal article, or some government official would tell you something. You have to go through a process of trying to vet the information. Sometimes the specifics, and if not, at least the kind of general sense of it that, that fits within the realm of the possible. And I simply couldn't. That doesn't mean that it isn't happening. It simply means that I, I, could, I couldn't say. And so I don't know on the first issue uh, of North Korea. On the issue of increasing transfer knowledge to other groups, this Hezbollah does uh, extensively. Hezbollah has been involved in training other groups for a very, very long time. Not only other Shia groups as in Iraq, um, but other Sunni groups, I mentioned the Shabaab. When Al-Qaeda set out to bomb the East Africa embassy bombings in the late uh, 1990s, they came, and this is documented in the 9-11 Commission report and in other CIA documents that have since been declassified and you can find on the internet, that they made a deal with Iran, that Iran would provide some training to Al-Qaeda operatives and Hezbollah would provide other training this doesn't mean that Iran is now part of Al-Qaeda. It does not mean that Hezbollah is now part of Al-Qaeda. It just meant that they were willing to help each other out to target their shared enemy, the United States. But that they did. And this is documented quite well. Now, some of the other things that I found in the course of the book were, to flip your question a little bit, not in terms of the knowledge that Hezbollah is providing to others, but the knowledge and transfer that Iran provides to Hezbollah. And some of these cases, especially these FBI investigations, you have Hezbollah people bragging about Hezbollah getting access to the feed from Iranian satellites so that they can use that for targeting, especially in Israel. I'd mentioned the uh, ability to get um, counterfeiting machines, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 both the paper, very high quality paper to counterfeit bills, and the machines needed to run those bills uh, that's being done out of the Becca Valley. Uh, and so there's really significant support uh, of a technology transfer nature. And then, of course, also operationally. So, for example, uh, 
1992-1994 bombings in Buenos Aires, Hezbollah carried out the attacks, but almost all of the surveillance, procurement of the explosives, procurement of the vehicles, uh, secure communications, not all, but most of it was done by Iranian agents, many of them operating out of the embassies. Excuse me. The connections there are not ideological at all, but the connections are strong. Um, the problem with my book in South America is that I had too much information and my editor is making cut some of it out because there's just too much to say. And it's killing me because it's great stuff. Um, a friend of mine is the former um, uh, head of special operations for the Drug Enforcement Administration. And he has described publicly before Congress and other, again, you can find, uh, his name is Michael Braun, B-R-A-U-N. You can find his stuff on the internet. How Hezbollah and other criminals, including drug cartels, they're not ideological partners. They're not, it's not that the cartels are not part of Hezbollah, but they work together for joint criminal interests. And the way he describes it, it's a little bit disgusting, but it's his description, not mine. They stay in the same seedy hotels. They go to the same brothels. They hang out at the same scummy bars. They're trading know-how, they're trading knowledge, and they're cooperating together. It's not the case that if I need someone to move a product, he has to be a member of my group. I use a smuggler who today may be smuggling a Hezbollah operative, tomorrow may be smuggling you know, human trafficking or guns or narcotics or cigarettes or whatever. And that type of overlap, that kind of Venn diagram, should not surprise at all. I'll get to you both, I promise. Um, well, thank you so much, um, first of all, for your uh, incredible talk. And um, you mentioned that changes are happening in, uh, in Europe, and you mentioned uh, the role of Cyprus. And um, earlier this year, um, the foreign minister of Cyprus delivered a speech in Washington, D.C., um, standing uh, very firmly on the side of Israel and the United States in the issue of uh, Iran and Islamist terrorism. That same lady um, refused to, to designate Hezbollah as um, a terrorist organization after the Bulgarian uh, att terrorist attacks. That same lady intervened when um, Ali Akbar Salehi, the Iranian foreign minister, was briefly arrested in Cyprus. And so my question is, where do you see that final pressure um, coming from, and how would it look like to really make Europe to go that final path to really make sort of force Europe into that um, uh, sort of decision making that, you know, you can't dance at two weddings. You can't go to Washington and say you're on the side of the United States and Israel and at the same time try to do some sort of appeasement uh, with Iran and, uh, and Hezbollah. Thanks. Uh, hi, Matthew. Benny, Michael. Um, just in terms of the uh, Bulgarian operation, um, if you could maybe delve a little bit more into um, how Hezbollah's infrastructure in Europe functions. Israeli journalists have told me who are immersed in this case that, it was, that the Iranians or the, this joint Iranian Hezbollah project brought in someone or people who were working with um, a Hezbollah infrastructure in Bulgaria. And what is the composition of, for example, the 950 members of Hezbollah in Germany? How does it work? Is there a bodega-style Hezbollah store where I go to to become a member? Um, who are these folks, and how are they assisting um, the folks in Lebanon and around, um, around the world? You want to? Let's take his question, too, because he's been waiting so patiently, and then I'll answer everything, or almost everything. Okay, uh, Jonathan Beckerle, also from the Middle East Freedom Forum. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, some questions regarding the Iranian uh, Hezbollah relation. First of all, um, 
Can you tell us if there is something like a clear, uh, let's say, chain of command and uh, division of labor regarding the uh, foreign operations, uh, especially terror attacks? So, for example, is it true, like some experts say, that you know the, the, all the foreign operations are in the end commanded from from Iran? And um, this, uh, the second thing is, uh, since you talked about uh, criminal activities of, of Hezbollah, um, what, what, you think it would be possible that at some point uh, Hezbollah is um, moving away from Iran, not so much because they're uh, becoming more moderate, but just because they're becoming an established bourgeois party who has some uh, interests like, let's say, doing uh, 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 drug business and other things. Uh, and just to make money, and that at some point their ideological thing becomes something like a burden for them? Okay, here we go, ready? Um, Cypriot foreign minister talk, dancing at two weddings. I like that, by the way. I'm going to use that. A um, couple of things. One is, Often, officials from countries where Hezbollah has done things and where there are investigations going on feel an additional burden of not getting out in front of things because they fear being prejudicial to the investigation. That frustrates a lot of people because they feel, look, Hezbollah is now accused of doing things in your country. But often those officials will say privately, yeah, therefore there's a process going on. I can't get out in front of it because it'll look like I'm prejudging the outcome of what should be a, a free and fair uh, trial. That's one issue. Second, as you were speaking, it reminded me of another, maybe one of the most important reasons why, historically, um, Hezbollah has not been designated, and really actually why many countries have not done a whole variety of other things about Hezbollah, and that is fear. France in particular, other countries as well, um, some would say Germany, especially those like France and Germany that have suffered from Hezbollah attacks or attempted attacks, fear antagonizing the group. Their fear is they're not targeting us right now. If we don't antagonize them, they won't target us tomorrow. France felt that the 85-86 bombings wasn't because Hezbollah hated France, but it was primarily because Iran was really upset at France for siding with Iraq and providing weapons to Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war. And that's correct. That really was the main driving factor. Doesn't explain why they bombed the French barracks in Beirut all the way back then in 1983. And it doesn't explain why Hezbollah targeted in two different instances in 2011, to come a little bit closer to now, why they targeted French UNIFIL authorities, in one case civilian, in one case military, in southern Lebanon. I think it's the wrong lesson to learn. I think we should not be afraid to live in our own, uh, you know, afraid, of, afraid of our own shadow. And you need to be able to take a principled position. But that is also a factor. And I think some of the smaller countries in particular are concerned about that. For better and for worse, both. For worse, because it's unfortunate it happened. For better, because if it happened, then at least some good should come of it. Once Hezbollah continues to engage in attacks in the same place, say Cyprus, and there have now been multiple attacks or attempted attacks in Cyprus, countries begin to get annoyed. And they begin to think, well, if they're going to do it anyway, might as well try and do something to make it more difficult for them to do that. So we'll see what happens there. <clears throat> um, look, there's not a whole lot that we can say publicly, and I don't mean to imply that I have special knowledge. I've told you I'm a former law enforcement and intelligence, and it's not like in the movies. I really am former. Uh, I don't have any special knowledge about the Bulgarian investigation. But I have interviewed people, and there is stuff that is out in the press. And the stuff that's out in the press that I have then spoken to people about to say, is this true, and they've said yes. But all they're confirming is what's out in the press, so let's be clear, especially for the journalists, um, that there was intelligence signals intelligence, in te intercepted telephone communication that apparently makes it very, very clear that Hezbollah was involved in this attack. 
This is not special information coming from Matt Levitt. Don't say, according to Matt Levitt, there was signals intelligence. You, you want to know? We can talk about it. I think it was even in the New York Times. Um, that doesn't mean they're going to be able to put together a law enforcement investigation. More often than not, sensitive sources and methods cannot be put at risk to support a law enforcement investigation. And as I understand it, they're having a very, having a very hard time uh, putting together DNA uh, uh, matches. Um, there was uh, uh, an ID that was found, which was a very sloppy uh, fake ID uh, from uh, a, a Michigan driver's license with a New Orleans, or anyway, a Louisiana address. So kind of sloppy operation. I can't explain that, but it was very clearly not the real ID. I understand that this investigation is moving very slowly. So when the Bulgarians say they don't want to say anything publicly, I don't blame them. I, again, I started my career in FBI. Don't get ahead of the investigation. You'll get in trouble then, because you'll say it's Hezbollah, and then what happens if you can't back that up with law enforcement evidence? It's not enough to be able to say, well, but believe me, trust me, there's, there's intelligence. Journalists like you won't take them at their word, and you shouldn't. So <clears throat> it's hard to know. That said, in the course of doing research for my book, I did come across a Bulgarian government report from, I think it was several years ago. Uh, I think it was 2008. You can check. I, I wrote an op-ed shortly after the uh, attack in, uh, in the Daily Beast, which is up on the Washington Institute's website, uh, that talks about concerns about Hezbollah involved in criminal activity in cooperation with organized crime in drugs in Bulgaria. So is it possible that they leverage criminal networks? Yes. We know that Hezbollah and the Quds Force both have leveraged criminal networks to carry out attacks. In one of the attacks that was carried out by the Quds Force, not Hezbollah, in Azerbaijan, so I'm not talking about the 2008 Hezbollah attack, but the more recent, I think it was 2010 or 11, we have to check, I can't remember offhand, uh, Quds Force plot in, um, in Baku, they primarily relied on criminal networks uh, in Azerbaijan to carry out uh, that thwarted plot. So that's definitely possible. There's a long history of Hezbollah operating with the support of Iranian intelligence, out of Iranian embassies, using Iranian cover, again, in Argentina, where we have a tremendous amount of intelligence that's been made public by the um, more recent Nisman Burgas, the Argentinian prosecutor's report, uh, reports of Iranian front companies being established to collect intelligence, of Mohsen Rabbani, who was serving as a, an official of the Iranian Ministry of, of like Meat Import or something like that, and was serving as the imam of a mosque until just before the bombing, when he suddenly got diplomatic cover as an Iranian diplomat, that he was in Argentina for years beforehand setting up an intelligence network. He referred to them as the people he recruited as his antennas. So there's a long history of this, but frankly at this point in terms of Bulgaria, it's speculation. It's just saying we know that they've done this and operated this way in the past. We're going to have to wait to see what, what comes out. And we may have to deal with the unsatisfying reality that it might not come out. <clears throat> no, uh, there is no kind of bodega or Hezbollah headquarters with a little you know, sign played out in front, you know, Hezbollah Inc. Um, there are a whole host of institutions that have been kind of outed, some of whom, some of which I've mentioned. Al Manar had a presence here. The Orphan Welfare Project was here. Um, there have been a variety of individuals here. Um, frankly, German law enforcement and intelligence tends to be very, very good about being on top of them. And it may frustrate the journalists that they don't go public with this stuff, but historically they're very good. The Stefan Smyrna case, that I mentioned earlier, it wasn't the Israelis who first found out about him. It was the Germans who told the Israelis. So there's good cooperation. It tends to be quiet. On the flip side, when the Israelis prosecuted Smerek, uh, the German govern government asked him to be sent home to Germany so that he could be tried here. But the German government was not going to try him on explicit terrorism charges just a kind of vague intent to do harm to people charge. And so Israel said no. And unfortunately, 
Though their names were made public at the time, Germany chose not to prosecute the two individuals here in Germany who recruited him. So I don't know if it's because they tried to put together a case and they couldn't hit the legal threshold, which sometimes happens and is very frustrating for the prosecutors who want to indict those people, or if it was a political decision, I honestly don't know. But it, the reality is that it's much more complicated than just having a kind of central committee. I, I imagine that many of the Hezbollah supporters and operatives in this country don't know one another. Sure, I'm sure that some do. In terms of the Iran-Hezbollah relationship, um, and the division of labor between their terrorist attacks. At no time, <clears throat> and this gets to the next question too, at no time ever will core Hezbollah, Hezbollah leadership break from Iran. To suggest that is to suggest a misunderstanding of what Hezbollah is all about. Hezbollah has three main identities, Lebanese, Shia, and Iranian proxy. Not because Iran gives them the money and buys that support, but because they believe that the supreme leader of Iran is the Veliat al faqih the rule of the jurisprudent. This they believe. Read Naim Qasim's book, Inside Hezbollah, in Arabic or English. It makes this very, very clear. It's not making any apologies for it. For them, this is their religious belief. And I think we're foolish not to take them at their word and understand this as it is. And that helps explain why this relationship has become only stronger over time, not weaker. Because of that, as an institution, no, Hezbollah will never simply become bourgeois, political, or become so involved in crime that they break from Iran. But we do see it happen with individual Hezbollah supporters. Because many of the supporters in the, in the diaspora, outside of Lebanon, are not really such super religious people. In fact, many of them like living in the diaspora because they can have prostitutes and they can engage in crime and they can do all kinds of things that would be frowned upon if they were back in Lebanon. People are always surprised. And I get asked all the time, I've got this case, but he's Hezbollah and that's a religious group, but I see him going to um, you know, uh, uh, strip bars and going out with prostitutes. How could this be? It's not uncommon at all. You won't see Nasrallah do it. You won't see, you know, hardcore people and they, who are truly religious as they define it. But you'll see many supporters in the diaspora who are not so religious. And their support for Hezbollah is not so much because of what they believe God is telling them to do or what they believe the supreme leader of Iran is telling them to do. It has more to do with politics. It has more to do with hating Israel. It has more to do with standing up for the Shia community in the face of the Maronites and the Sunnis or a combination of all those things. That said, and I've been waiting for this question about the difference between division of labor between these attacks. And I was surprised no one took me up on my offer from before because this helps explain what's going on in terms of the attacks today. No one has said to me, Matt, you talked about Hezbollah's attacks, Bulgaria and Cyprus, and you even mentioned Johannesburg and Thailand, but you haven't mentioned all the Quds Force attacks in India and Georgia, and Baku, and Thailand, and much, much more. How do, you, how do you explain this? And I explain it this way. And it'll help explain this division of labor. Sometimes Hezbollah and Iran operate together. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're even in competition, as they are a little bit now. <clears throat> in 2009, September 2009, Hezbollah tried to carry out a third attempt at a major attack against an Israeli diplomat as a retaliation for the assassination of Imad Mugnia, September 2009 in Turkey. They had failed in Egypt, they had failed in Baku, and so this time Iran's Quds Force provided much more tangible logistical support for the attack. And still they failed, which is good news. But Iran was extremely angry. And they were yelling at Hezbollah. And Hezbollah was yelling back. And lots of finger pointing. While this finger pointing and arguing is going on in the end of 2009, a whole host of events start to happen which begins to completely change Iran's calculus. Stuxnet. Defections of Iranian Revolutionary Guards officials. 
And more than anything else, the assassination of Mohammadi, the first of now a series of Iranian scientists to be killed at home, among other things, creating this humiliating and sh reality where Iran is being depicted as unable to protect its scientists, even at home. It would be bad enough that they were killed abroad, but they're being killed on home turf. Suddenly, Iran feels the need to strike back out of its own interest, not just out of revenge from Ugnia. And so Iran informs Hezbollah, and because they are the prima inter pares, the first among equals in this partnership, they're in a position to do so. Hezbollah, you're going to do two things. First, you're going to take off several months and you're going to get your act together. You're going to recruit some of your best people from the military wing and transfer them to the terrorist wing, which they did. You're going to spend some time and develop capabilities that have rusted on the vine because since 2001 you've stopped doing real good things abroad because you wanted to stay out of the crosshairs of the war on terrorism. And when you're ready, you will then start targeting Israeli tourists, not as revenge from Ugnia, but because we're telling you to, as part of our shadow war campaign, to tell Israel and the West that there's a cost to doing shadow war things against us. And that if you do attack us over a nuclear program, we can do this and much more. Develop a new sense of deterrence through asymmetric warfare. Nasrallah, by the way, after the first failed attempt to target Israeli tourists in Cyprus, gave an interview to a Kuwaiti newspaper. And the Kuwaiti uh, reporter said to him, so what have you forgotten about Mugnia? You failed and now you haven't done anything. And he says, no, no, we haven't failed, nor have we forgotten. If we haven't succeeded, it's because Allah and in his infinite wisdom, God doesn't want us to succeed yet. But when he's ready for us to succeed, we will succeed inshallah with the will, be, may it be the will of God. And as for other things, if we wanted to, he said, we could target Israeli ter terrorists here or there in lots of different places, no problem. But that's not what we want to do for Mugnia. For Mugnia, we're going to hit somebody of equal stature within Israel society. We don't listen when they tell us in explicit terms what they're up to. Meanwhile, Hezbollah reserved for itself for the Quds Force two types of operations and created a new unit within the Quds Force, Unit 400, to do so. One, hit formal targets, diplomats, Israelis in particular, but not only. They've killed Saudi diplomats in Pakistan. They've targeted U.S. diplomats in Azerbaijan and U.S. and U.K. diplomats in Kenya, among other plots. And aside from these diplomats, they also were going to target kind of informal government targets, targets that would be representative of the Israeli or Jewish communities. So they've looked at targeting the Israeli shipping line, Zim. They targeted a Jewish school and a rabbi in Azerbaijan. And they targeted a Georgian citizen who was working as a foreign service national in the Israeli embassy. But he was not targeted by mistake, thinking that he was an Israeli. They knew full well that this was a Georgian citizen. And they're getting frustrated because the, uh, the, the security protection around the world is much, much improved since 9-11. It doesn't make a difference if you're Al-Qaeda or Hezbollah or somebody else. The security measures put in place affect all the bad guys. On top of that, Israel listened when Nasrallah op uh, threatened open war. And therefore, it's much harder to target an Israeli diplomat. So much so that reportedly Hezbollah gave up on trying to hit an actual diplomat in India and settled, reportedly, on targeting whatever the next car was that would come out of the embassy, which happened to be a car carrying the wife of the defense attaché. But reportedly, she was not targeted. They just had to do something. There's an element of competition now between the Quds Force and Hezbollah. Quds Force is very happy that Hezbollah succeeded in Burgas. But as far as they're concerned, Hezbollah has one success and they have none. It's almost like a one nothing in terms of their competition to see who can do more. Increasingly, by the way, because it's so hard for Hezbollah to find a, an Israeli target of stature for them to target abroad in retaliation for Mugnia, they are resorting to a tried and true technique of trying to target Israeli officials in Israel using drugs for intel, uh, 
um, channels that they've done for many, many years, providing drugs through the town of Rajar, which straddles the blue line dividing Lebanon and Israel, in exchange for intelligence, mostly from Israeli Arabs, but sometimes Jewish Israeli criminals as well. And they have thwarted, reportedly, two different attempts. One involved an, uh, an Israeli Arab who was collecting intelligence, reportedly, on Israeli President Shimon Peres, and another where a drug network moved a, 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 a package that they believed were drugs, but in fact was something like 20 kilo of explosives. So the Israelis believe they've thwarted two different potential plots where Hezbollah was going to try and take revenge from Mugnia by targeting someone in Israel. And you can imagine, by the way, how, how, how pleased Iran would be with that, because Iran loves the symbolism. When the Quds Force did these February 18, 19 attacks in India, Georgia, and Thailand, they used sticky bombs. The symbolism was clear because the Iranian scientists, several of them, were also killed with these sticky bombs. Iran would love for Israeli officials to be killed in Israel, much as its scientists have been killed in Iran. You can keep the cheese as long as there's one. <laughs> Mr. Levitt, thank you for a truly interesting and insightful talk. Um, my name is Frank Horst from the Young Transatlantic Conservative Alliance, and I got one short question for you. Um, you've brief, you, you've touched the, uh, sorry, <laughs> you've briefly touched already um, upon the um, connection of the Shia expert community in some countries to uh, Hezbollah operatives. Um, we in Germany, we have like a quite, well, you, you would say like a, a vivid connection here. Um, as we also have the um, Iranian headquarters of Europe and the um, representative of the Iranian uh, supreme leader in Hamburg. Uh, but we have also seen like every year uh, the Al-Quds um, uh, the Al demonstration here in Berlin uh, that was usually organized by Iran and attended by uh, Hezbollah members, by left-wing parties and other um, Islamists. And uh, of course we also have uh, seen Hezbollah flags flying in 2006 um, during the Lebanon war. Do you know about any other Western country uh, with a Shia community that at least like partially is very supportive of Hezbollah? And do you know of any programs in the Western world to kind of like try and counter this um, support from the community that Hezbollah gets? It's a very good question. And I know you didn't say this, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I also want to be clear on the record for the camera and everybody else. It's not the case that everybody in the Shia communities or the Lebanese communities are Hezbollah supporters. Far from it. But it is the case that where there are Lebanese Hezbollah, I'm sorry, Lebanese Shia communities, Hezbollah supporters can hide in plain sight as Lebanese Shia without waving the Hezbollah flag, except in those cases where they do. You have to leave July 2006 as an outlier. It's an exception. Many people who aren't Hezbollah were waving those flags. They were doing it in the United States and Canada. They were doing it in some very, very Jewish communities in North America because lots and lots of people were very angry about that conflict. They were right, they were wrong, it doesn't make a difference. But even beyond July 2006, when you have the Al-Quds celebration, both in countries like Germany where you have large Lebanese Shia populations and in countries like Austria next door where you do not, you have all good celebrations, and you will see the Hezbollah flag flying from time to time. You know, even in Lebanon, there are some very famous pictures circulating on the internet right now, both from July 2006 and even from just a couple of weeks ago, showing some very skimpily dressed women, showing a lot of skin, draping themselves in Hezbollah flags. Different people show support for Hezbollah for different reasons doesn't mean that they're all card-carrying members, as if. <clears throat> but the fact is, in those places where there are large expatriate communities, Hezbollah is able to function with greater ease, and over the, historically, over time, has built significant networks. Nowhere more so than in South America and in Africa. Again, this is not to say that all or the majority of those communities are Hezbollah supporters. In fact, one of the things that they're able to do well within these types of communities is mafia-style shakedowns. 
You go to someone who owns a store and you say, it would be a real shame if your window got broken. You know, one way to make sure that doesn't happen is by putting this Hezbollah charity box here because no one will touch you if you do that. And then you just break the windows of a few people who don't and people got the message. Sometimes it's much worse than that. In the United States, uh, FBI has documented cases where people have been approached, and in Canada too I know of some cases, where people have been approached, and if you have someone who's of Lebanese extraction, they're, down, they're bound to have family back home, and they've been approached and said, hey, you know you have family back home? It'd be a shame if something happened to them. You know, there's a great way to make sure nothing happens to them. Just, you know, it's give to the cause, it's what you should be doing anyway. We're the only ones who support the Shia, we're the only ones who stand up to Israel. We do great charity work and we're a political party, you really should be. There's all kinds of different ways that they can do this. And they're extremely creative and resourceful. Spall has been involved in blood diamonds in Africa, mafia-style shakedowns in South America, North America, Africa, the abuse of charity, credit card fraud, cigarette smuggling, you name it, they've been doing it. It's just that within these communities, they're able to do more. There's no one thing I can tell you as to how you deal with it, other than you have to empower law enforcement and intelligence to be able to investigate these things as terrorism cases. It is not enough to assume that they will always be breaking the law and you will always stumble upon them because of their smuggling or fraud or what have you. Sometimes you will, but you also need to come in it as an intelligence investigation. And if you don't, then at best you will be 50% successful. So it is critical, we come back to where we started, to empower your services and one of the things that again the US government has now been explicit about, John Brennan said it in, in Ireland, designate Hezbollah so that we all have the authorities to investigate their support for terrorism for what it is. Thank you very much.